Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is renowned for leadership, resilience and dedication and is a distinguished supporter of the Iranian people and resistance. Taking the stage now is the former Prime Minister of Ireland and leader of Ireland's Fine Gael Party, the Honourable Ender Kenny. Good evening. Madam Rajiv, you show, you display a biblical capacity to display your patience. You need it all for politics. Well done. Thank you, Senator Chambers and the Irish delegation for your words and for the work that you're doing and have done in the Senate and in the Irish Parliament in respect of Iran. I believe strongly in the rights of our Iranian people and every other people to live in a secular and democratic republic where no individual, regardless of religion or birthright, has any privilege over others. I come from Ireland. I'm a Catholic. I was never in Iran, but I do know something about your situation. I am opposed to the death penalty, and I'm a member of the International Commission Against the Death Penalty. My country, which abolished this many years ago, will shortly join the support group of members against the death penalty. I too signed the letters of former Prime Ministers on this matter. See, we have a written constitution where the people are the masters and government its servants, where the executive and the judiciary are clearly separated, where church and state are clearly separated, where the rights of children are enshrined in the constitution, where freedom of expression, of religion, our universal and where equality of marriage and women's rights to medical facilities have all been adopted by referendum of the people and enshrined into law in the Constitution. But just because I come from a small country doesn't mean, actually, that you can't make an impression at a global level. Iran was a founding member of the United Nations. And every day since that United Nations was founded, our country a neutral country from a military point of view, has had troops, small in number, on some locations on this planet on peacekeeping or peace enforcement duties. And it was in 1958 that an Irish Minister for External Affairs produced an Irish resolution which morphed into the first nuclear non-proliferation treaty now of such importance to the globe. And it was in September 2015 that the historic Sustainable Development Goals, chaired by Ireland, were brought before the United Nations, adopted by the United Nations, and signed by 193 countries of great importance to the rising generation. This planet that we live on faces many challenges – climate change, poverty, famine, sickness, areas of conflict and war population explosion, genocide, illiteracy and ignorance, and many other problems that can only be dealt by, with by cooperation and modern solutions. Unfortunately, too, many millions live under the brutal regimes of dictatorship, of autocracy and murderous theocratic existence. Iran is a case in point, and I know that the Iranian people reject such philosophy. The march to freedom and democracy and equal rights is never easy, nor will it be, nor has it been for the Iranian people. As former Speaker Perko will know, it took us a long time to achieve separation for the domination of the British Empire, 700 years, and it's still not done in totality. But we've been very good friends for a long time. Martin Luther King and his people had many years of peaceful protest for civil rights for black people and the right to vote for black people in the United States in the face of appalling brutality by a white police force before federal America responded. Nelson Mandela 
campaign for 27 years to end the apartheid regime in South Africa before achieving success on the right of millions of South African people to vote in free elections. In Ireland, we had a terrorist campaign for 30 years by the provisional IRA trying to wreck a fragile peace and with the work of Britain, the United States and Europe and everybody else concerned in the civil rights movement, peace was achieved. And while our state is separated from the church, all of the religions in Ireland recommended restraint and understanding in the face of constant pressure. I've heard most things today about Iran, but I read something recently that I think is worth repeating. In times of crisis where dictatorships apply, the normal story is to avoid the truth at all costs. But one report that does not avoid the truth is the report by the United Nations on rights in Iran published this March because it's stark and riveting in its findings. Its author does not lie or ignore the truth of what is happening in Iran under this regime. Javid Rehman deplored the brutal response of the government to nationwide protests that erupted last September after the arrest of Masha Amini and her violent beating while being transferred to the Vazara Detention Centre in Tehran and her death subsequently in Kazo Hospital. I salute that young woman's courage and bravery and resilience and I hope that her spirit will stand to the Iranian people in the future. That report also deals with the use of unlawful lethal force against protesters and outlines specific instances where this happened. The report deals with the arrests and the detention of protesters, 18,000 arrested since the beginning of protests, dozens of human rights defenders, 500 students, 45 lawyers, and 576 civil society activists. That report also deals with the torture and the ill treatment of protesters, including sexual abuse, the sweeping crackdown on civil society, including human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, and artists. They're being charged with offenses and their communications methods being, uh, being confiscated. He also deals further in blatant truth with the harassment of families and the cover-up of human rights violations, the sentencing of protesters following grossly unfair trials, the execution of at least 500 people in 2022, including two persons sentenced as children and 13 women. The Aban Tribunal, which investigated the protests of 2019, issued its judgment on November the 1st last year. Its findings, listen to this, unanimously established beyond reasonable doubt that the Iranian government and the security forces designed and implemented a plan to commit crimes against humanity of murder, imprisonment, enforced disappearance, torture and sexual violence in order to quell the protests and conceal the crimes committed. To think that I was contacted before, before I came here by the, Iranian, uh, by the Iranian embassy to tell me that I was going to meet the terrorists and members of a cult. Are these things happening in the eyes of the world? Why is Iran not fulfilling its international obligations under the conventions of the right for the child and the international covenant on civil and political rights? These findings do not make for an, an Iran that you can be proud of. Nor does the funding of terrorists in the greater region to exercise destabilization, that does not make an Iran to be proud of. And most definitely, the supplying of Russian to Russia of missiles and drones for the purpose of destroying Ukraine and the killing of thousands of innocent people in a totally illegal and appalling invasion do not make for a proud Iran. And finally, to speak of the threat to use nuclear bombs to obliterate 
and destroy millions of people is simply beyond comprehension. But this regime has not gone and will become more paranoid, more brutal, more violent and more dangerous before it fractures. And fracture it will. And it will fracture in the face of overwhelming support for a new direction for Iran by millions of Iranian people who are not afraid to stand out in non-violent and peaceful demonstration for what are their legitimate aspirations. How many people are prepared to do that in front of a police force that has directions from the very top not to show any leniency and these figures in the United Nations report prove itself. And when that regime falls, Madam, it will be as sudden as the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the removal of the hated Ceausescu regime of 37 years in Romania. Then the real leaders, the real leaders, the young people of Iran must be given their opportunity and no hiatus created to allow anything else. And they will then see the benefit of a democratic and secular state. You will have a new country, a new beginning, and a new and proud outlook, where Iran's message will be about life and living, and not about death and destruction, where the music and laughter of the children is heard in the schools and the homes, not inhibited by fear and by dread and where young men and young women can follow their dreams and their ambitions in an Iran secular and democratic in structure and focused on playing its part, sanctions free, in dealing with the common challenges of our humanity on this our only planet with the freedom and opportunity that that democracy brings. So I say to this regime, change will come. It is on its way. So whatever your creed or none, whoever you worship and believe in or none, remember and understand this, that every child is born with a purpose. And for children in Iran specifically, that purpose is not when they grow up to inflict brutality, torture, violence, sexual abuse, forced imprisonment and execution on innocent fellow countrymen and countrywomen at the behest of any regime. So let me leave the people of Iran with this thought. There is always a way to a better world. There is always hope for a better alternative. And your 10-point plan is the basis for that new Iran. This, this, this message of hope is best enshrined in the words of one of our famous poets, the Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney, in his poem, Cure of Troy, where he says, history says don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. You are that tidal wave. Keep your courage, continue your journey, and Iran will be proud again. Thank you.